Well, thanks for listening in. It's great to join you virtually. I'm thrilled to get to share with you about how we've been using this massive distributed computing project called Folding at Home to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but before I get into that, I need to give you a little bit of background just so you can understand where we're coming from. And so uh, to bring you up to speed, the, the real purpose of Folding at Home, or our focal point right now, is understanding how these molecules called proteins function and how they malfunction in different diseases like Alzheimer's disease, uh, for example, and how we can use this information to inform the development of new drugs and therapeutics. And this has really broad reaching uh, implications because proteins are responsible for most of the active processes that we associate with life, whether it's muscle contraction or sensing light in the eye or digesting food, this is all done by proteins. Now, unfortunately, proteins are also used by infectious diseases like bacteria and viruses to wreak havoc on us. And they also, if they malfunction, can cause diseases ranging from cancer to Alzheimer's disease and myriad other maladies that we would like to avoid and be able to treat. Uh, and so our, our objective is really to understand how these things function properly, what happens when they go wrong, and how we can control them. So just to give you a, a concrete example, this is a protein that I've worked on for a long time called beta-lactamase. And so what I'm showing you is a single snapshot of this protein with a small sphere corresponding to each atom in the protein. And these aren't the actual colors of these atoms, they're just for our own intuition. So the, the grayish ones are carbon and blue is nitrogen, red is oxygen. Uh, and this gives us a lot of information about this protein. Uh, and in particular, there's a site I've labeled the active site, which is this pocket on the protein surface. And that's where this particular protein performs an active process, that's the name. In this case, this protein is able to bind to antibiotics that we use to kill bacteria, and it cleaves a key part of the antibiotic to inactivate it. So bacteria actually express these proteins, they make them and uh, put them out into their environment to chew up antibiotics and protect themselves from our drugs. And so you can imagine that we as humans who want to sometimes kill off nasty bacterial infections would like to prevent the function of proteins like this. And so in this case, given this one snapshot that's been derived from some really powerful experimental techniques, the obvious way to potentially do that is to design a drug that binds to this active site uh, pocket and blocks this protein from interacting with antibiotics. But, but as I told you before, these proteins are really molecular machines on a very tiny size scale. And like the machines that we're used to working with on our own size scales, like cars, for example, they have a lot of moving parts. And one of the challenges for us as scientists is that we're often blind to these moving parts because there's no microscope where we can zoom in and watch all of the atoms in a molecule like this move about over time. And so what those of us in the computational community have worked on for a long time are methods for actually using computers to simulate how these moving parts work. And so here I'm going to show you a little snippet of one of these calculations where you can see that all of these atoms in the protein are moving about. And down in the lower left, I've, I've highlighted a region I want to particularly draw your attention to because beyond just wiggling about, these atoms actually open up and create a binding pocket uh, similar in size to the active site that I highlighted before, that we could potentially target with small molecule drugs. And, and we had no knowledge of this uh, site before uh, running these simulations, uh, given the, the static snapshot that I showed you on the first slide. And so we're very interested in finding moving parts like this, understanding their implications for how this protein works, and exploiting it as a new target for the development of therapeutics. Now, one of the challenges is that these calculations are extremely computationally expensive. On a really nice desktop computer, getting at the uh, time scales of protein motions that I'd really like to have access to could easily take hundreds, thousands, or millions of years, depending on the protein. And, and so what we've done is taken these essentially intractable calculations and devised ways to break them up into lots of small pieces that we can run in parallel on different computers. And taking this approach to its logical extension, we said, well, we can buy a bunch of computers, but there's so many computers out there. How about we create a project where we go and invite anyone on the internet who's willing to contribute their compute power to help us run these enormous simulations. 
Uh, and so 20 years ago, the Folding at Home uh, project was born to do just this. Uh, and so what I'm showing you here is a map of the globe where there's a little pinprick of light everywhere that someone is running uh, simulations for us and sending data back to us to aggregate together into these uh, very powerful models of, of protein dynamics. Uh, and at the, uh, the beginning of 2020, we had about 30,000 people around the world uh, helping us run these simulations. And looking at these, this map of where these people are is, is really appropriate, actually, because in, in a lot of respects, what we're trying to do with this data is build a map of what these proteins do. And, and much the same if we wanted to build out a map of the, the globe like this one, you know, it'd be very slow to have one person walk around and explore this space. You could get the information much more quickly if you had thousands or tens of thousands or more people fan out across the globe and explore small regions of the planet and then pool all of that information. And so that's exactly what we're doing with our simulations, is sending them out in all different directions and then pooling all of that information together to get a much larger scale picture of what's going on beyond the reach of any individual simulation. So, so again, at the beginning of 2020, we were uh, busily applying this approach to a wide range of problems. So I told you a little bit about our work in antibiotic resistance. We were also working on Ebola virus and Alzheimer's and a, a few forms of cancer, actually, trying to understand how these diseases work and how we could counteract them. Uh, and of course, as you all know too well, uh, then the COVID-19 pandemic came and, and just changed everything. And so given that we were already working on infectious diseases like Ebola virus, it was very natural for us to say, well, let's pivot and take all of these resources that we have and start directing them at the pandemic. And, and we already were in a really good position in terms of the sheer compute power that we could bring to bear on the proteins from the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 disease. But there was an even bigger response to our work uh, as everyone's attention was focused on the pandemic. Uh, so, so as I said, at the beginning of 2020, we had about 30,000 devices participating in Folding at Home. Uh, and here what I'm showing in blue is the uh, cumulative downloads of our software over time starting in March. Uh, and so what you can see is that over a, a matter of a few months, we had well over a million new citizen scientists uh, install our software and start volunteering their computers to contribute to these huge calculations. Uh, and, and this tracks interestingly with the uh, growth in cases of the virus uh, in orange, where you can see that there was an explosion in uh, uh, interest in folding at home as the virus started to take off. And, and we all realized that it, it wasn't going to just be somewhere else in the, the planet, it was going to impact all of us. And so the upshot of this is now we have a, an even more amazing compute resource. So what I'm showing here is the performance of uh, the world's top supercomputers. So on the y-axis vertical is the uh, measure of the performance of these machines in terms of floating point operations per second or, or flops, and in this case, in exaflops. And so what you can see from the bar uh, second to the right is that the world's fastest traditional supercomputer, the Summit supercomputer, has a peak performance of about 200 petaflops. Uh, and with very conservative estimates of the performance of the machines that are participating in building at home, uh, we have cleared the exascale uh, boundary. So uh, roughly five times, uh, at least the performance of the world's fastest traditional su supercomputer. And we're bringing it all to bear on uh, proteins from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it's a, an immense opportunity to really uh, try a lot of things in parallel and try to accelerate the development of uh, vaccines or drugs or other therapeutics uh, as much as we can by understanding how these proteins work uh, and what opportunities there are to control their function. So coming back to the, the virus, you're, you're all, all too familiar with this image of the virus, I imagine, at this point. Uh, but just to make sure, again, that we're on the same page, each of these red protrusions sticking out from the surface of the virus is a complex of three proteins actually called the spike. Uh, and this one is a really interesting one because being on the surface of the virus, it's readily accessible to therapeutics and uh, our immune uh, uh, systems, uh, as well as to engage with a host, potential host cell. 
So the virus is playing this interesting game where in some ways it's exposing itself, but it has to because it needs this protein out on the surface, uh, feeling around for a potential host cell so that it can latch on to a receptor on that cell called ACE2 uh, and in in initiate infection of that cell. Uh, but at the same time that it needs to be able to detect and initiate infection of a host cell, it needs to be able to hide from our immune systems or, or therapeutics. And so what it's devised is what we call a conformational masking strategy, where the structure that you see in red is actually the uh, complex of proteins kind of folded up on itself to protect the key bits that actually engage with a host cell, uh, presenting more variable regions that are harder for our immune systems to recognize. And in order to actually be able to recognize a host cell and initiate infection, this complex has to open up to reveal this uh, more conserved, uh, less variable part of the protein that actually binds to uh, proteins on a human cell. And, and unfortunately, this closed up structure is the dominant structure. And, and we actually know very little, relatively speaking, about what this open structure looks like and what opportunities it uh, presents for the development of therapeutics. And so we really wanted to go after this with our simulations and understand what that opening motion looks like uh, and how we can potentially control it. So here I'm showing a different view of the spike protein. Just to tie it back to the previous image, the upper left is the end that is tethered to the surface of the virus. And the lower right is the part that's pointing out away from the virus and waiting to engage with a human cell. Uh, and so this is this closed state, and there's three colors here. Those are the three proteins, and this ribbon traces the chain of chemicals called amino acids that make up each of these proteins. And the sort of transparent surface is a space-filling view of where the atoms in this protein are to give you a sense of, you know, this is this solid object. Uh, and what we can do is start our, our simulations, and we've built this whole map of the different motions that this protein can undergo. And normally, all that one would see with a uh, lesser computational resource would be this wiggling around the starting structure. Uh, but as we watch this uh, trajectory or simulation from our, our model progress, you can see that there's this dramatic opening motion that now exposes the surface that binds to this ACE2 receptor and is actually crucial for initiating infection. And so this is a, a really tremendous feat to actually see this because from our perspective, this is a very large protein and it'd be very difficult to get this without the sort of resources that we have access to unfolding at home. And now we're taking this information and using these structures along the way uh, uh, to uh, inform the development of, of drugs and to start asking, well, how could we modify this protein in order to help create a more effective vaccine, for example? So there's a lot going on in parallel, even just with this one protein, but we're actually trying to do as much as we can with as many of the proteins from the virus as possible. Uh, so this is a, another example. This is called the main protease, and it's one of the prominent targets for the development of therapeutics. So I'm showing you in, in white the surface of this protein, and in yellow sticks is a potential uh, small molecule drug that could turn into a, a way of combating this virus. And so what we're doing with folding at home is simulating lots of complexes between this protein uh, and small molecules that could serve as potential leads for the development of a, a drug and trying to sort them to identify those that actually bind most tightly and are therefore the best to follow up on experimentally. And this is extremely valuable because with the breadth of folding at home, we're now screening tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of compounds at this point. And we can do this all in parallel and then help our experimental collaborators to direct their uh, finite resources and time at the compounds that are most likely to be effective uh, and start moving those forward through the drug development pipeline. So this is work that's largely being spearheaded by my colleagues, John Canera and Vince Bowles uh, through their participation in the COVID moonshot, which is this collaborative effort to try to create a patent-free inhibitor of the main protease uh, that will help all of us to stay safe from this pandemic. So this gives you a, a little bit of the flavor of the sorts of things that we're, we're doing. Uh, as I said, there's a lot going on in parallel. Uh, and as you can imagine, I probably wouldn't be here today if ARM wasn't a part of that. Uh, and so I'm proud to uh, share that we are actively working with ARM and Neocortex to incorporate support for ARM chips into folding at home. 
And so I invite you to keep an eye out on our progress at our website, foldingathome.org, and watch for uh, your opportunities to contribute all of your myriad devices to help move this science forward. So with that, I'd like to thank our amazing global community for moving this science forward. And this includes a, a huge community of citizen scientists, at times up to a million strong, and many millions over the years that have contributed their personal computers to help run these calculations. Of course, I'd also like to thank our amazing scientific team uh, that actually plans out the scientific research we pursue and performs all of the analysis and collaborates with our experimental colleagues to drive uh, our understanding of these complex systems and efforts to advance the development of new therapeutics. Uh, and finally, all of the contributors that help us to keep the infrastructure running, uh, including ARM and Neocortex, who are helping us to bring more devices into the fold, so to speak, uh, and help uh, accelerate our scientific progress. And thank you again for listening. And I hope you'll continue following us at our website, foldingathome.org, and on social media uh, to track how our progress is going and how your computer, I hope, is being used to accelerate progress both on COVID-19 uh, and a myriad of other uh, important biomedical problems where this compute power really has a lot to offer. So thank you again.